Okay, I think we have it sorted out. We'll see how this all works out. Hey everybody, Jem Schofield here with the C47. It is Tuesday, February 14th in the U.S. And uh, as far as Hallmark is concerned, today is Valentine's Day. It also happens to be my wife's birthday. So I am shooting this on Tuesday for Wednesday. Um, this is kind of a follow-up to the last episode that I did. And I will say at the beginning of the episode... Uh, please, I do encourage everybody to ask questions that are about what I'm talking about, uh, and also just general production-based questions. Um, also, please don't forget to click on that little logo, the C47, and subscribe to the channel. The more subscribers I have, the more time I can spend on creating content for you. Um, that is at no cost, except for having to deal with... Uh, the cost of listening to me blab about what it is that we do. Um, again, I have a live chat up here, so if you have questions, just type them in. I will be checking that uh, on a regular basis, and I am happy to answer general production questions about cameras, about lights, about production in general, um, just questions that you have about getting the job done, about craft, and all that kind of stuff. So... Um, when I shot my last live streams, I had some serious technical difficulties. I'm not saying that those are going to go away completely until I get a, a better signal out here in the back cave. But um, I had shot some stuff having to do with standard dynamic range, high dynamic range, talking about color spaces, sort of where we're going with production. And this is a pretty deep subject, so I'm not going to get into everything today. But I do want to start to bring up some of this stuff verbally. And then as we go on into future episodes, uh, both as live streams and then also as just sort of standard shot episodes, I want to show you some more practical applications of this stuff when it relates to using your camera systems. Um, so let's just, uh, let me just go ahead and share my screen with everybody. And I'm going to switch over to a keynote presentation. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, a couple of things here. Now, you'll see here that it says high dynamic range, or HDR. Um, you know, in the past, and even very much so today, we are dealing with standard dynamic range, or referred to as SDR. Um, I would say that on average, on older television sets, we might have been getting, if we take a look at uh, stops of dynamic range, about six stops of dynamic range in terms of what we could view on our displays. And with sort of modern uh, televisions that are still SDR, we're probably getting somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to nine stops of dynamic range that is visible to us. As humans, we can see a lot more of those stops or steps. Um, this is a grayscale chart from DSC Labs, and you can see that it is uh, in f-stops, or steps, and it is showing you essentially, uh, you know, a scale going from black to white. And I think that in the future, um, when we look at standards like Dolby Vision, they'll want to have upwards of 21 stops of dynamic range in displays. We're not even close to that right now, but I think that the future in terms of what we're going to be able to see in displays is going to be quite different than what we're looking at nowadays. So we go back to this grayscale chart and we talk about high dynamic range, and, and generally to me that means that uh, I guess the easiest way to talk about it is to say that high dynamic range in terms of luminance or light uh, levels having to do with black to white uh, is generally going to be anything above uh, nine stops of dynamic range. Some people would argue it's anything above six or seven, but when we talk about HDR related specifically to these stops, we are talking generally about, I would say, at least 10 plus stops of dynamic range. Modern digital cinema cameras, um, pretty much any modern digital cinema camera that, um, you know, that starts with, let's just say, a Sony FS5, a Canon C100, um, 
pretty much any camera that shoots log has the capability in terms of uh, the gamma curve of capturing at least 10 plus stops of dynamic range. Uh, newer camera systems are capturing in the neighborhood of 14 to 16 stops of dynamic range, which gets much closer to what we can actually see with the human eye when we're looking at an image. Um, there's debate out there in terms of how many stops we can see. Some people say 14, some people say much more than that. Uh, but needless to say, the new digital cinema cameras that are on the market are capable of um, many more stops of dynamic range in terms of capture than we can actually see with the displays that we're looking at today. There are some displays on the market, albeit very expensive, which can let us see more of that dynamic range. But as time goes on and we start to move into uh, 4K and UHD ultra high definition resolutions, we will see displays on the market that are uh, definitely going to allow us to see a lot more of that image. I'm actually going to do something which I haven't done yet, which is give myself a little toggle here so that I can switch on and off my full screen. I think that's done. Um, and I can just quickly go back to uh, myself. So any questions so far having to do with the SDR, HDR dynamic range? You can just type those into the live chat and, um, you know, quickly. Okay, uh, I think I've got this back now, so hopefully you guys are staying with me and we can continue this conversation. I just changed my settings in terms of uh, my stream and I went down to uh, 2,500 kilobits per second instead of 5,000. So let's see how that goes. Hopefully everything will be clear enough for everybody. And uh, that way we can continue on without me having to start new stream. So I'm, again, I apologize for this. This is a little bit of a work in progress in terms of figuring all this stuff out. The primary thing is just more bandwidth here and it's not as easy um, as it seems because this space is separate from where my main internet is in my house. So um, I'm gonna have to get a dedicated line. That's gonna cost money. So be it. Okay, so let's switch over here back to the keynote. So color spaces. So we have our, our basic uh, standard color space right now. A lot of us are capturing in BT 709 or Rec 709, uh, but we are definitely pushing out to that color space. So we call that our target space. Um, so Rec 709 is really the color space that we are um, finishing in, in terms of most of our projects. And why is that? Well, the reason is that the vast majority of the high definition displays and even some of the UHD displays that we are viewing content on are using that color space. Um, and so we target it so that everything looks the way it's supposed to look. So we're looking at two things here. We're looking at our gamma which is really defining, you know, sort of our luminance levels from blacks to whites. And then we're also looking at our color space and how much color is actually captured and also what we target in terms of our, uh, our space, in terms of our final output. So that's today. But as we go forward, we are going to be looking at different color spaces. And the reason that that's important is because not only do the cameras we use have the capability now of capturing in color spaces that are considerably larger than BT or Rec. 709, which by the way is essentially the same as sRGB in terms of that overall color space, um, you know, we we're going to be targeting bigger color spaces. So if you take a look at this graphic here, you'll see the little itty bitty triangle uh, inside there, which is BT709 or Rec709. And then the next triangle you'll see is called DCI P3. Uh, DCI stands for Digital Cinema Initiative. And uh, this color space is the target color space that is used for uh, theatrical distribution. 
So when you go see a feature film in a cinema that is digitally projected, um, when something is captured by a camera, they generally will have to do a, uh, a target to Rec. 709 for the vast majority of the displays that are on the market. And then they will also have to target that DCI P3 color space and uh, target that as well. And it's a different color space. It's expanded, so they have to make sure that everything looks correct for that particular color space. Um, okay, so back to this graphic here. So we take a look at it and then we see the next triangle which is even larger and that is the BT2020 or Rec 2020 um, color space. And we're starting to see, um, well we already have had um, specs for HDR distribution. And to me HDR really has to do with um, these luminance levels here it doesn't necessarily have to do with this color space, but they are becoming one in the same based on the specs. We have two basic specs, HDR10 and Dolby Vision. Um, this is something we'll get into more if people want to. And by the way, again, please ask questions while we do this. I am looking at the live chat and questions are welcome. So 2020, as you can see, is much, much larger. And um, this means that we have to have displays that not only are showing us Rec. 709, but also P3 and eventually probably 2020. And there's not really much out there in terms of these displays. Um, there are uh, a few displays on the market from uh, Sony and Canon that definitely will show you the P3 color space. There are actually monitors from companies like Flanders Scientific and Small HD, which will also do that. Um, but there are few, if any, displays out there that really are capable of showing you the entire Rec. 2020 color space. Now, there's a couple of other larger triangles here. The one I'm going to show you or talk about on this particular uh, graphic here is the one that's called Cinema Gamut, and it's ginormaloid. It's much larger than 709, P3, or 2020, and this particular gamut is uh, a gamut that can be captured with a camera like the C300 Mark II from Canon and the C700. So you can see that you can capture in a much, much larger color space. And then because you're capturing that larger color space, you can target all of these other color spaces when you finish this stuff. I know this is a geeky one, guys. We're going to get to something a little less geeky next time. Now I'm going to go to the next graphic here. And we'll see um, on the left-hand side, don't even look at the right-hand side right now, we can see uh, another graphic, and this really refers to color spaces related to Sony digital cinema cameras. And we see the Rec. 709 triangle, we see the DCI Digital Cinema Initiative P3 uh, triangle, and then we see S Gamut 3. Cine, and we see S Gamut 3. And these are capture color spaces that you can set up and capture from on cameras like the FS5, uh, the FS7, F5, F55. But they are also color spaces, believe it or not, that you can capture in in a camera like the A7R2 or the A7S2. So those are mirrorless small camera systems that give you the ability to capture in um, a log. Uh, gamma curve. What is log? Well, this is basically a Rec. 709 curve on a camera like the Ari Alexa, and you can see the distribution of where all of the uh, color chips are falling on a waveform monitor. You guys can see that. And we see that down here there's black, which is sitting right just above zero, and that's this chip right here. And then we have our next darkest gray chip, which is over here on the left. That's showing up here on the left-hand side. Then we have the next chip, which is here, and so on and so forth. Um, when we switch a camera system over to a log gamma curve, and remember, this has to do with capturing luminance levels, then we redistribute those chips in terms of how they're captured and they are essentially protected. And the idea is that what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're capturing all of that shadow information, all of that highlight information, and then later on, 
in post-production, we will essentially redistribute them back to the values that we want within um, that scale. So when we look at log footage, it's relatively flat overall. Um, and then later on, when we start to make adjustments, we're making adjustments to both the luminance levels and we also will do stuff having to do with the chroma or color information having to do with the image. And so these two things go hand in hand, the color space and the gamma curve. And one of the problems that a lot of people run into when they are um, shooting with these camera systems is, holy mother, I think I screwed this up. Oh my God, guys. No, I didn't. I see everything. It's all good. Okay. I have a reference over here in terms of the live stream, so I think we're okay. <clears throat> okay. So um, let me repeat that just in case it didn't come through. So I was talking about a camera like the A7S II, and that camera system when you're recording in HD is recording at 50 megabits per second. I mean, there's other settings, but let's just say we want to record at the best quality that we can. And then um, if you switch the camera over and you're recording um, in UHD, four times the resolution, it actually is at 100 megabits per second. So you would think we would go to 200 megabits per second, 50 times four, uh, but that's not actually what happens. So what you have to consider when you are doing this, and let's just go back to this chart here, is you have to think about all of that dynamic range that you're capturing, and you have to think about how large of a color space you are capturing in your image. And this can have a direct impact in terms of what quality you're getting with your recording. So for instance, let's just say you wanted to uh, record in log on something like an A7S II and you wanted to maximize your dynamic range so that you could protect your highlights primarily, let's say. Um, what you might not want to do in that situation is also choose a ginormaloid color space. You might not want to choose S gamut 3 cine. Why? Because the data rate that you're recording to that camera is so low that there's only so much of that that you can allocate to that huge color space and all of those stops of dynamic range. And I can tell you from experience uh, and from a mathematical standpoint that your image will break much faster. If you were recording on a camera system that was capable of the same log gamma curve and a uh, large color space, let's say a PXW FS7, and you decided to do the same thing, you would have a lot more information in the image. You would be not only recording um, at a much, much higher data rate, you would also be recording in 10 bit instead of 8 bit. And so you are going to have a lot more there to work with in post. Your image is not going to break as quickly. And that is just the reality of. Um, working with these camera systems. So what recommendation? My recommendation is, first of all, to experiment. But if you are shooting with a camera system like the A7R2 or the A7S2, if you're shooting with, um, you know, any of these smaller mirrorless cameras, which are giving you log and also very, very high quality, um, you know, uh, log and very, very large color spaces, then you might want to not record in that larger color space. And what you might want to do is set your camera to something like Rec. 709 for the color space. So sure, experiment with log recording for your gamma curve, but then think about actually switching to Rec. 709 as your capture color space. Because um, more than likely in the very sort of near future, that's going to be your target color space anyway. And as we start to see more of these uh, P3 displays and eventually possibly 2020 displays, then we will also start to get camera systems that will be able to capture um, smaller cameras that will be able to capture in 10-bit 
that we'll be able to capture at higher data rates. In fact, we're already starting to see that in a camera like the GH5, which is coming to market. It's a 10-bit. Uh, it's going to be able to record at higher data rates. I don't know how they're going to handle the heat issue on that, but uh, apparently with a firmware update, you're going to be able to go all the way up to 400 megabits per second uh, in certain configurations on that camera system. So what that means for you is um, be careful. Be careful about your settings on your camera system and experiment a little bit. My best recommendation is don't shoot in those larger color spaces with smaller camera systems most of the time. Um, it'll tend to be uh, dis a disadvantage in terms of what you're doing. And because you will kind of be forced when you're shooting in log in these larger color spaces to do a grade, um, to touch the image, it will be, um, you know, it'll be something that breaks a lot faster on those smaller camera systems. So I think that's basically it. I mean, a another example of that, just so that you know, is the, um, the Cinema EOS cameras from Canon, the original C300, uh, the C100, the C100 Mark II, they are all capable of uh, capturing in Canon Log, which on those cameras I would say is about 12 stops of dynamic range. Um, they also have a, a, a color space, um, but the color space is actually not the cinema gamut, or these larger color spaces. Their color space is based on a Rec. 709 color space. And so the reason it's so easy to grade uh, stuff that's coming off of a C300, C100, C100 Mark II, even when you're using CP Cinema Locked and you're setting the camera that way, is because you are not capturing this larger color space, which where the triangle may not be aligned directly to Rec. 709. Because you can see here that the triangles aren't necessarily perfectly aligned with the target color space of 709. And as a result, um, that also makes it very difficult for people to work with the footage later on in terms of what they're doing. So let me just show that to you again. I'm sorry. Um, you'll see that the triangle here is not necessarily aligned with the Rec. 709 triangle. And so when you're starting to grade with these larger color spaces, it's not as easy. SCAM at 3.Cine by Sony, by the way, um, is actually aligned very well with Rec. 709, so it's much easier to go from that color space to 709 than it is, let's say, from SCAM at 3 to 709 um, because it's not really aligned. But when we start to move to things like the P3 color space, then SCAM at 3 is more aligned with that, so it may be easier to use that. Um, Man, it's a rabbit hole out there. I'm telling you. Um, I hope that wasn't too geeky, and I want to show you guys more of this in the future. But um, at least that gives you something to think about. What's the basic boiled down thing that I'm saying? Um, if you're shooting with a camera like an A7 series camera from Sony, then definitely experiment with log so that you can retain um, especially highlight information. And if you are doing that, um, you can experiment with both S-Log2 and S-Log3, but my recommendation on those cameras would be to actually set the color gamut to Rec. 709 and see how that goes for you. You'll be um, using a much smaller color space. You don't have a lot of data to allocate to all that information anyway. I think you'll find that uh, it'll be a little easier. I hope the quality of this final stream is okay because it looks like ass over here on... <laughs> <laughs> on uh, the, the live stream. So we'll see what happens with what gets pushed out from here. Um, I will work out this whole thing. And do I have any other questions from the people that are watching at the moment uh, or any questions at all related to this or to production before I end this episode? And trust me, if this episode sucks, I'm going to re-record it. Um, I mean, it might suck in terms of content, but I'm just going to say if it's unwatchable, besides what I'm saying, then uh, I'll have to do another episode. Signing off for now. Sayonara.